Well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, shall we? Matthew chapter 7. Today we come to the last chapter in what's called the Sermon of the King. We also call it the Sermon on the Mount. It began back in chapter 5 dealing with what we are. And then in chapter 6 it turned to what we are do. And the idea is pretty simple. When we truly understand what we are in Christ, we're righteous, we're perfect, it should affect our lives in what we do. And so far we looked at seven things we do. We looked at giving, praying, forgiving, fasting. We looked at um, storing, serving, and last time we were together, number seven, it involved worrying. Worrying. And Jesus said, knock it off. Just stop it. He said, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, nor about your body, what you, what you shall wear. In other words, don't worry about the things of the world. Don't seek after the things of the world because everything in the world is either going to A, rust and dissolve, B, be stolen, or three, burn with fire. It's all going to dissolve. So don't seek it. In fact, Jesus went on to say in verse 33 of chapter 6, to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So don't worry about anything else. Now, this brings us to chapter 7, where Jesus deals with a few more things about us doing, if you will. So let's pick up our reading in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 14 in our study today. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you used, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye? And, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them." For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go down in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, uh, in these first 14 verses, if you're outlining our study today or taking notes, uh, we're going to look at four more things in light of what we do. The first thing involves judging. That's in verses 1 through 6. The second thing involves asking. That's in verses 7 through 11. The third thing involves doing. That is in verse 12. And the fourth and final thing involves entering. That's in verses 13 and 14. 14. So let's draw back and look at this first section. It involves judging. And we would mention three things in verses 1 through 6 about judging. Number one, first of all, we have a command to stop judging. A command to stop judging. Look at verse 1 again. In Matthew 7, 1, judge not. Stop right there. There's the first thing. Now this is an imperative or a command but the grammar implies that this is an action that is already in progress. In other words, judging is something we are already involved in and we need to stop it. We need to knock it off. Kind of interesting, this word judge that's used here is the word 
carino. It's used 113 times in the New Testament. It means to separate, to divide. We might say to draw a conclusion. Now, <laughs> we can judge the actions of other people, and we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But this particular kind of judgment is talking about judging the motive behind the actions of people. And for you and I, this is something we cannot do. We can't draw a conclusion as to why somebody is doing what they are doing. We can evaluate and judge what they're doing, more on that in just a sec, but we can't draw a conclusion as to why they're doing what they're doing because that goes to motive. And motive speaks of the heart. And you and I have no idea what's in people's hearts. In fact, God said in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. It's God who searches the motive of the heart, not you, not me. Uh, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, he said, I am the one who searches the mind and the heart. Only God can draw a conclusion or judge, the word carino, as it pertains to the motive behind the action. So, this begs the question for us. Can we judge other people? The answer is yes. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes, we can judge other people. We judge their actions, not their motive. In fact, interestingly enough, there's another word for judge. It's the word dia carino. It's a compound word. Dia, meaning two. Carino means to separate or to divide. So when we judge the dia carino, we separate or divide two things. We make a judgment or divide between right and wrong. We judge between good and bad. Follow me? And that begs the question, how do we judge between these two things, between good and bad and right and wrong? Well, uh, you and I use the Bible. We judge what's right or wrong based on what the Word of God says. Now, unfortunately, society today, in its relativistic type of mentality, how there are no absolutes, everything's relative kind of ideology, uh, they base their moral compass on what is right and what is wrong on what they think or what they feel. Now, the problem with that is what we think and what we feel oftentimes is based on what we eat. Amen? I mean... I mean, is this the Holy Spirit speaking to me or the pepperoni pizza I ate the night before? I don't know. So for us, it's not about what we think or what we feel. It's not even about what laws are legislated. No, the final court of arbitration, the line drawn in the sand, the plumb bob in which we gauge or judge, or it's the word discern, by the way, the dia carino, we get our word discernment. We discern between good and bad, right and wrong, is based solely on the Word of God. In fact, if you would, drop down to verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, take a look at verse 11. It says, but now I have written to you, speaking of the church at Corinth, these believers, not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So clearly, you and I can judge other believers based on their actions. How do we know who to hang out with, who not to hang out with, who to associate with, who to go out to dinner with, who to go on vacations with? Well, Paul says we need to diacarino, we need to discern or judge between believers based on their actions. Listen, we can say we're a believer all day long, but what kind of life are we living? 
The Bible's very clear. We judge between fornicators, covetous, idolaters, and the list goes on. Uh, take a look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. For what, what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Speaking of non-believers, well, the answer is nothing. We don't judge non-believers. Why? Well, because they don't hold to the same standards we do. They have their own ideal of morality. They, they live their life in light of their own moral compass, what they think or what they feel. So we don't judge them. Of course, we see their actions and we say they're wrong based on the Word of God, obviously. But for us to tell them their actions are wrong based on the Word of God does no good. Why? Well, because they don't believe in the Word of God. So I think Paul said, what do I have to do with judging those who are outside? The answer is nothing. But it goes on. Verse 12, do you not judge those who are inside? Yes, we judge fellow believers based on what the Bible says. Verse 13, but those who are outside, the non-believers, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself that wicked person. We, of course, have to judge, discern right from wrong, good for good good and bad based on what the Bible says. So do we judge other people? Yes, absolutely. I saw a fellow at the beach. He, he had a big tattoo. It says, uh, only God can judge me. I thought, that's not right. <laughs> Listen, before you permanently put something on your body, you, you should probably make sure it's true. You know what I'm saying? Because now he's going to have to get a line across and say, not. Um, <laughs> So, so clearly we can judge other people. In fact, look at verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before saints? Do you not know that saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Of course we're going to judge men and angels. That speaks of the millennial kingdom, by the way. But the point is, if we're going to do it then, surely we're qualified to do it now. What qualifies us to judge the actions of other people, other believers today? Oh, we have the Bible it's not wrong because I think it's wrong. It's not wrong because I say it's wrong. It's wrong because God says it's wrong. And this is for us, by the way, for believers. And unfortunately, a lot of churches and denominations and cults today, they do the weirdest, wackiest, way out things. And I've heard pastors say, well, I just feel it's the right thing to do. You feel it's the right thing to do. Look, I feel like I need a back rub, but what does that mean? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I feel like I need new shoes. What does that have to do with any? Who cares what we feel? Who cares what we think? The bottom line is, what does God's Word declare? Capish? Back to Matthew chapter 7. Let's come to the second thing about judging. We said there were three. We've looked at the command to stop judging. Number two, let's take a look at the reason for not judging. What is the reason for not judging others? Well, we're going to be judged. Look at verse 1 again. In Matthew 7, 1, it says, Judge not. Why? That you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you used in judging others, it will be measured back to you. So why should we stop judging other people in a hypocritical, holier-than-thou, self-righteous, pious kind of way, thinking that somehow I know why you're doing what you're doing? Why should we stop that? Well, because that's exactly how we're going to be judged. Question, as believers, are we going to be judged by Jesus Christ? The answer is yes, no question about it. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So as believers, we're all going to be judged. Obviously not on our eternal life, not on salvation. So what are we going to be judged on? Are you ready for this? 
we're going to be judged based on the motive of our actions. Now, we should always do the right thing. Don't misunderstand. But even when we're doing the right thing, a holy thing, a righteous thing, a biblical thing, a spiritual thing, which we all should be doing, we need to make sure we're doing it with the right heart or the right motive. Because God's not overly concerned with what we do as it pertains to doing good things. What he's concerned with is the reason behind it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says that all of our works will be tried as by fire to see what sort or what manner they are of. So apparently, everything we do, everything we say, is going to be evaluated in light of the motive of our heart. And when we stand before God, before Jesus Christ, that's what's going to be tried as by fire. And if what we do, as righteous as it is, is done with the wrong motive, it's all going to burn up like hay, wood, and stubble. But if it's done with the right motive, it's going to last like gold, silver, and precious stone. So this becomes an important issue in light of us judging other people. In fact, listen to what Paul said in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 2, verse 1. He said, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? The answer, of course, is no. Listen, we need to be careful. We need to stop judging other people in light of their motive. Only their actions we can judge, not their motive. Because when we judge other people's motive, we judge their heart, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't like that. So for you and I, it's, a, it's an important um, point to be sure. Well, back to Matthew chapter 7. Let's come to the third and final thing in this first section, dealing with judging. <clears throat> and that involves illustrations about judging. Illustrations about judging. That's in verses 3 through 6. And there are two of them. There are two illustrations to drive home this point about judging. The first illustration involves helping others. That's in verses 3 through 5. Helping others. Question. Should we help other people who are in sin? The answer is yes. There's no question about it. We certainly, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, says if a brother falls, you who are spiritual, restore them. So yeah, we're to come along the side of other people. We're to help them. However, this illustration really illuminates an important point in our own lives. Take a look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, this sin that he's doing in his life, but you do not consider the plank, this giant piece of wood, in your own eye? Wow. You know, sometimes when we have this heart, this desire to help other people with their sin, one reason we like to do it is because we think that somehow we're so much better than they are because we, of course, aren't involved in that sin. We're not doing that sin, and therefore we come to them and think, well, you know, uh, I can help you because I'm not bound up by that particular sin. I'm much more holy and spiritual than you are. God help us all. Hey, look, all of us, we've got this giant plank in our own eye we need to deal with before we can reach out and help other people in pulling this little speck out of their eye. Well, look at verse 4. It goes on. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck out of your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Now, this could carry the idea of, of, of the same sin. Verse 3 could carry the idea of us having a different sin, thinking their sin is so much worse than our sin, so we're able to help them. But here, the implication in verse 4 is that our sins are alike. And, and I guess the application is pretty powerful. Because when we look at somebody's life and they're involved in a sin, the same sin we're involved in, when they do it, why does it look so much worse when they're doing it? When we do it, we think, eh, it's not so bad. 
Well, you know, I mean, you know. But boy, when they do it, woo, that's terrible. That's tragic. Brother, let me help you. It's very interesting. Well, verse 5, this goes on. It says, hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye and you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So the whole idea here in helping others is we need to cry out to God to help ourselves first. In other words, look, we all have a giant plank in our eye. We all have got sin issues. We all have problems. And we need to cry out to God and repent and get right with God and say, God, I'm struggling with this area in my life. I need your help to deliver me from it. And when we do that, now all of a sudden we recognize how gracious God is and we now will be able to help other people in dealing with their issues. We're not going to look down on them with a holier-than-thou, self-righteous, pious kind of attitude, but we're going to come alongside of them as equals saying, look, I'm just as messed up as you are, but God helped me. God delivered me, and if he can save me, <laughs> listen, there's nobody beyond his reach, <laughs> because the truth of the matter is you are just as messed up as I am, and that's messed up. <laughs> but praise be to God when we cry out to him and say, God, please help me, forgive me, deliver me. Man, he is so faithful. And then now we can come alongside and help others. I love this first illustration, helping others. Number two, the second illustration involves giving to others. Giving to others. Look at verse six. It says, do not give what is holy, probably speaking of the gospel message, to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Why? Lest they trample them under, feet, under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. Wow. So in the context of judging, we need to judge or discern between two things, those who are dogs and pigs and those who are not. Follow me? So we have to determine who's a dog and who's a pig and who's not. You say, Clark, that's easy. My husband's both. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> Now, please don't think of a cute little dog, this puppy and these little pigs, you know, with the pot bellies and they run around the house and you pet them and have them on leashes. I mean, eh, no, no. The, the context is dealing with wild dogs and wild pigs, things that can turn around and tear you to pieces. In fact, turn over to Matthew 10, if you would, please, just a couple of pages to the right. Matthew chapter 10. Because it would seem... We need to judge, we need to have discernment between those who are open to the gospel message and those who are not open to the gospel message, dogs and pigs. Now, true, we should tell everybody about the gospel. Don't misunderstand. We tell everybody about Jesus. But the point is, if we're dealing with dogs and pigs, we're wasting our time. We tell them the truth, but they're not open to it. So what do we do? We go find people who are. You know, I like what Pastor Chuck used to say. People asked him about Israel, you know, as his many trips to Israel. Pastor Chuck, why don't you do some evangelistic uh, outreaches in Israel? He said, I love this. He said, I like to fish where the fish are biting. You know, in Romans chapter 11, God has veiled the gospel to them. You know, there's a blindness supernaturally. So uh, there's a parallel here. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the 12, uh, down in verse 14 of Matthew 10, he tells them this. He says, and whoever will not receive nor hear your words, speaking of dogs and pigs, then depart from that house or city, shake off the dust for, from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that city. So for you and I, we judge or discern between those who are open to the gospel and those who are not open to the gospel. Seems pretty straightforward. Well, back to Matthew chapter 7. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. We have to hurry. We've looked at judging. Uh, the second thing involves asking. 
asking. That's in verses 7 through 11. Uh, And we would mention two things about asking. Uh, The first thing involves the command to keep asking. There is a command to keep asking. Look at verse 7. Back in Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Now, asking, seeking, and knocking, these are all imperatives. They're all commands. And the grammar is such that it indicates a continual action. In other words, we are commanded to keep on asking, keep on seeking, and keep on knocking. Now, when it talks about asking, seeking, and knocking, these all carry the same idea. We call it prayer. (laughs) Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on on praying, we would say. You say, okay, Clark, I'll bite. What should we keep on praying for? Well, in the context of our passage, it's dealing with prayer judging. So apparently, we need to keep on praying about this issue of judgment. So what should we ask God for in light of us judging other people's actions? Wisdom would be a good thing. We should ask God for wisdom. God, give me wisdom to be able to have discernment or judgment between what is good and what is bad. And give me wisdom in how best to approach it. Not with a holier than thou kind of attitude, thinking that I'm so much better than everyone else. But Lord, give me wisdom. And here's the good news, class. According to James chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom, and that little preposition is in the first class condition, by the way, It says, since in fact we do lack wisdom, let us ask of God, who gives liberally to all. So all of us need wisdom. Okay, three of us anyway, fine. We all need wisdom in being able to judge or discern between right and wrong, according to the Word of God, as well as how to implement that in helping others and giving to others. So it really pulls this whole context together. Well, number two, we said there were two things about asking. Number one is a command to keep on asking. The second thing, and I like this one, it involves the confidence we have in asking. The confidence we have in asking. That's in verses 8 through 11. Take a look. In verse 8 of Matthew 7, it says, For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks, it will be opened. In fact, drop back to verse 7 for a moment. Look at verse 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be. Do we have confidence? Do we have absolute confidence in asking God for wisdom or anything else as it pertains to answered prayer? The answer is yes. In fact, that is further illustrated in our text. Look at verse 9. It says, What man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will, will, uh, will give him a stone? No, of course not. We're not going to give our kids stones if they're asking for bread. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? No, of course not. If you then, being evil, and we are, we know how to give good gifts to our children, and we do, How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Boy, what? listen, we have confidence in asking God in prayer. Absolute confidence. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, John says, this is the confidence that we have in Him, that whatever we ask according to His will, He hears us. Does God answer every single prayer of the believer. I think he does. I think he always answers every single... You know, the problem is we don't like the answer. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes it's wait and see. (laughs) I hate that one. I'm okay with yes, I'm okay with no, but waiting's for the birds, amen? Amen. God, here's my prayer, and you've got five minutes to pull it off. (laughs) 
Does anybody understand what we're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Some of us need more prayer than others. <laughs> the, po the point is we can have absolute confidence that God will answer our prayers. And what a beautiful thing this is. Well, let's come to the third thing we want to look at. The first involved judging. The second involves asking. The third involves doing. Doing, that's in verse 12. Take a look. In verse 12, it says, therefore. Now, this word therefore is summing up the section. Uh, therefore, in summation of the things we've said earlier, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Now, this, of course, is what we often call the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's a golden rule. Now, the world has a golden rule, by the way. It's he who has the gold makes the rules. That's the world's golden rule. And we all understand we need to treat other people how we want to be treated. I mean, that's just, we, we all know the verse. However, what intrigued me is at the end of verse 12, note carefully, class, that Jesus links the golden rule to the law and the prophets. He says, for this is the law and the prophets. Isn't that interesting? So the golden rule, doing to others as we want them to do to us, is linked to the law and the prophets. Why? Well, the law and the prophets are perfect. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, it says the law is holy, it's just. In verse 14 of Romans 7, it's spiritual. So the law and the prophets, those who spoke God's word, are perfect, holy, spiritual, righteous. I mean, it, it's a picture of God. So the law and the prophets point to and speak of God, which is interesting in light of what we saw back in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets, but to what? Fulfill them. So Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets. Question, how did he do it? Well, Jesus did not fulfill the law and the prophets by what he did. He fulfilled them by who he is. <laughs> who is Jesus Christ? Oh, he's God Almighty. That's why we read in 1 John uh, 1 John 4, 7, and 9. Is it 1? God is love, 1 John 4, 7. Is that 4, 4, 7, and 8? Two donuts for you. Yeah, 1 John 4, 7, and 8. God is love. So how do we treat other people? With love. We love them. You say, but Clark, there's some real stinkers out there. <laughs> yeah, like you're not one? Hey, look, we're all a bunch of stinkers. Okay, that was bad. Uh, <laughs> not even one amen, okay. You say, Clark, I could have got this kind of abuse at home. Uh, the, the, the point is, the point is when we, listen gang, when we receive God's love in that while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8, that's the kind of love that we in turn love others with. We can't love them with our love. Our love's conditional. I love you if. If you don't do this. If you do, do that. That's our kind of love. But God's love is unconditional. I'm, I am amazed that God even likes me, let alone loves me. <laughs> I feel that same way about you too, by the way. <laughs> But he does. So how can we not love others? You know, it's his loving kindness that leads to repentance. Not a heavy hand, not condemnation, not the law. Because the law was never given to make us righteous. It was just given to show us our need for righteousness. And what a, a picture this paints. Well, back to Matthew chapter 7 real quickly. Let's come to the fourth and final thing and we'll wrap this up right here. The fourth and final thing involves entering. Entering, that's in verses 13 and 14. And it involves two gates. Let's take a look at them individually. 
First of all, it involves entering the wide gate. The wide gate. Look at verse 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate. More on that in just a moment. Hold that thought. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. So the the gate that leads to destruction is a wide gate. It's a broad path. That's the road that is heavily traveled. It says many, verse 13, many go in by it. And the broad path, the wide door is what the world is offering. It looks very enticing. It looks attractive, fun. It looks like everybody's having a good time and millions of people are going down this road together and we think, wow, that's the road I want to go down. Wait a minute. Bible says it leads to destruction. That's the road apart from God. And it only leads to destruction. And you know as well as I do, a lot of religions today come up with two different ideas about this. They say, well, you know, you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ to to go to heaven. You just have to be sincere about what you believe in or who you believe in. Because really, you know, I mean, we're all worshiping the same God. It doesn't matter what you call him or her. It's all good. And then there are the other groups who say, well, you need to believe in Jesus Christ to go to heaven and (laughs) and you got to knock on so many doors and you have to rub so many beads and you have to wear special underwear and you have to, and you have to, follow me? Hey, listen, there's a lot of groups out there like that because the truth of the matter is all roads do lead to God. Everyone's going to stand before God, saint and sinner alike. But there's only one road that leads to heaven. And that brings us to the second gate. That is entering the narrow gate. Uh, Look at verse 13 again. Look at verse 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate. Now drop down to verse 14. Why? Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Boy, what a contrast. Wide gate. Wide road, narrow gate, narrow road. Easy path, difficult path. Now, this, of course, speaks of the two different gates. And in ancient times, walled cities would have two gates, a wide gate and a small gate. In fact, when we went to Israel, we were on the north side of the old city. The Damascus Gate is there. It's the newer Damascus Gate. It was built around 1537 under Suleiman the Magnificent, so it's a relatively new gate. Uh, But down below it is an excavation of the original Damascus Gate from 2,000 years ago. And you can see it, and there are two gates. There's a big gate that during the daytime, the big gate is open, so caravan and travelers and traders could come in and out of the city very easily. It was a very wide path no obstruction, but at nighttime, to keep any enemies from attacking, they would close the big gates, and within the big gate, there was a little gate, a little door. And that was a very difficult gate or door to go through. You would have to dismount your camel or your donkey. The camels would have to get down and crawl through. Donkeys would have to squeeze through. You'd have to take all of your wares, all of your goods off of your donkey and carry them through one box at a time. So entering that narrow gate was very, very difficult. And boy, what a picture that paints of Jesus Christ, that door, if you will. Because there is only one door to heaven, and it's Jesus Christ. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. And he who enters by me shall be saved. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, that guarantees our eternal life. Praise God, hallelujah for that. But don't misunderstand. It will be difficult Following Jesus Christ isn't easy. 
Your family will scorn you. Your friends will mock you. Your coworkers will ridicule you. You'll be hated by all. Boy, isn't that a great incentive to get saved? Uh, you know, in John 16, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Jesus said, they hated me. Guess what? They're going to hate you, my translation. But ultimately, listen, gang, ultimately, this is the biggest choice all of us have to make in our life. Because all of us have a lot of choices to make in life. Do we choose this or that? Do we go here, buy, buy this, buy that, go here, go there? Look, there's a lot of things we have to choose. But this by far is the single most important choice any of us will make because it involves our eternal life. You know, when Moses was talking to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30, in verse 19, he said, Today I set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life and live. And as we bow our hearts before the Lord, as Pastor Doug comes out, I guess the question that faces each and every one of us is very simple. What decision have you made in your life? What choices have you made as it pertains to the wide gate or the narrow gate? You know, maybe you're here today and you've not really made that choice, that decision to follow Jesus Christ. But God's been stirring your heart. Or maybe you've just walked away from God, put God on the back burner, but you feel His Spirit tugging in your life, tugging your heart. Or maybe you're just not really sure if you're going to heaven at all. Look, whatever the case may be, right where you're seated, right where you're at today, you can be guaranteed eternal life and all you have to do is say yes to Jesus. You don't have to get up. You don't have to go anywhere. And there is some, certainly nothing we can do. So right here and right now, you have to choose which road you're going to go down, which door you will walk through. And if God's been stirring your heart to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, to dedicate your life to Him right here, I just want to pray for you. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to do anything. or go Right where you're seated, I just want to pray for you. You slip up your hand so I can see it. Yes, God bless you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you. Right in the back, I see it. Yes, in the middle. God bless you. Right here. Put, you can put your hand down. I see it. God bless you. Maybe you're outside on the patio or in the overflow room or out in the foyer, wherever you're at on campus today. Don't put this decision off another moment because I'm not sure what tomorrow holds, but I certainly know who holds tomorrow. And if that's your heart, I want to pray for you. But before I do, you pray this prayer. You pray it in your heart. You can pray it personally, privately. But pray it meaningfully. Say, Jesus, right here, right now, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. And I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit that from this day forward, my life would never be the same that everything I say, everything I do, everywhere I go, Lord, it would just bless your heart. And Lord, I too pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for all of those who dedicated their life to you today. Father, I pray for your blessing upon them. Encourage them, empower them, strengthen them, lead, guide, and direct them, Lord, into all truth and to all righteousness for your name's sake. And we ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen.